بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We begin with the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal who has blessed us to gather in this blessed place We begin today inshallah with reading the hadiths of the book Umdatul Ahkam and the first chapter deals with purity Kitabu Tahara purity and the first hadith we have today is usually the first hadith in all books of fiqh because it is the main pillar of our religion and who will read this for us inshallah Shaykh Abdurrahman. Murdered Umar bin al Khattab, the Prophet said, The deeds are judged by intentions, and every person will get the reward according to what he intends. So whoever migrated for Allah and His Messenger, then his migration will be for Allah and His Messenger. And whoever migrated for worldly benefits or for marrying a woman, then his migration will be for what he migrated for. This hadith is one of the greatest hadiths in Islam. To the extent that scholars looked into the hadiths all together and said Islam revolves around three hadiths. And some said Islam revolves around four hadiths. So those who said that Islam revolves around three hadiths, the first hadith is Hadith Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, that deeds are judged by intentions. As in the translation here, the deeds are judged by intentions. The second hadith is Hadith Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, in Sahih Muslim and elsewhere, where she said, the Prophet said, alayhi salatu salam, whoever innovates, something in our religion that is not part of it, it is rejected. And the third hadith is Hadith al numan ibn Bashir ibn Sa'd, may Allah be pleased with them, where the Prophet said Al-Halal is clear and Al-Haram is clear and between them there are dubious matters. Al-Halal ubayin wa Al-Haram ubayin. And if you look at this hadith, I'm not going to go into the other hadiths because this is not our topic. Why is this hadith important? Well, we're talking about jurisprudence. We're talking about fiqh. We're talking about wudu. We're talking about salah. And all of these forms of worship depend entirely on intention. So, if the intention is good, you're okay. If your intention is bad, you're not okay. But what is intention? This is a very important question. Intention has two meanings, or it's divided into two sectors of Islam. The first is who you intend with the work you're doing. So, if I am jogging eight kilometers every day, what is my intention to become a footballer? to become an athlete. This is my intention. So it is for worldly gain. This person's praying. What is your intention? Why are you praying? You usually don't pray. Well, this is true. But my boss is next to me and I'm thinking of a raise. So I have to show him that I'm praying well. So his intention is for that boss. So this is the greatest intention on earth is the one you intend Allah with. And that is why deeds are worthless without intention. The hadith is clear. The deeds are judged by intentions. So if you do something in accordance to the sunnah, 100%, you pray in the first row of the masjid five times a day, like the hypocrites used to do. You believe that the Prophet is the messenger, like the hypocrites used to say. But Allah falsified what they said in the Quran by saying, and Allah testifies that they're liars. Why? The acts are like ours. 
They act like us, they behave like us, they even look like us. But their intentions are not for the sake of Allah. The second department, the second part, is the one that differentiates between forms of worship. And how is that? I go to the bathroom. I take off my clothes. Of course, the door is closed, you can't see. And I take a shower, full shower. What is that shower? If I intended that this shower is for removing the sexual impurity which I had, then now after the shower I can pray, correct? But if my intention was simply to get clean, I was smelly, I sweat a lot, so I just wanted to refresh myself. And after I went out, I remembered, oh, I am in the state of sexual impurity. I'm junub. Okay, it's okay. I just made a ghusl. It's okay. No, it's not okay. Because you had to have this intention before you took your bath. Likewise, someone goes to the bathroom, and I know a lot of people who come to me and say this. They say, Sheikh, it is a habit that whenever we answer the call of nature, we find ourselves washing our feet and we just realize that we've made wudu. So is this wudu acceptable? The answer is no, you did not intend it. Before you make wudu, you say, Bismillah, intention is there. So this is what differentiates dhuhr prayer from asr prayer, your intention. If you go into the masjid, asr prayer, and you say, Allahu Akbar, and in the first rak'ah I said, this is dhuhr. Is it? Huh? It's asr. Okay. It's asr. Switch from AC to DC. No. You started your prayer on what? On the account of dhuhr. Now it's asr. So this prayer is invalid. It turns into sunnah. You have to go out and you start it all over again. However, don't open the door for wiswas, for shaitan. Because if you perform wudu in your house and you walk to the masjid and you entered the masjid, but you're not thinking, when I walk to the masjid, do I say, I'm going for Asr, I'm going for Asr, I'm going for Asr. Assalamu alaikum, alaykum, I'm going for Asr, I'm going for Asr, I enter the masjid. And before the iqamah is being uh, uh, recited, say, I'm, this is Asr, this is Asr, Allahu Akbar, this is Asr, Allahu Akbar. <sighs> now I'm, I'm resting. No, nobody does this. So as long as you have performed wudu, at the time of Asr and went to the Masjid, your intention is Asr definitely. But you don't tell yourself. As long as you're praying the prayer of the time, Alhamdulillah. And that is why scholars say that the intentions are great doors for Shaitan to come from. It can destroy your Ibadah. It can destroy your life when you allow Shaitan to whisper into your ear, No, no, you did not intend this. No, you must have intended something else. So don't open the door for shaitan by doing this. Now, we have the issue of intention in every single thing we do. Do I have to say it? Meaning, we want to pray Asr. I usually hear people say, on the day of Tuesday, 11 November 2011, the Imam's name is so and so, and he lives in so and so. Allahu Akbar. What is this? Are you making a, a declaration of independence, for example? Or what, what are you doing? Sheikh, I'm, t I'm, I'm, I'm saying my niya. Well, the question is, who are you saying it to? It says to Allah. Allah doesn't know. Allah knows. Ah, uh, no, no, it's not for Allah, it's for me. You don't know what you are intending? You're crazy. Intention is in the heart. You don't have to say anything. Not only that, intention is everywhere. For example, I do this, and I drink, and I put it back. One says, Sheikh, what did you do? I drank. Did you intend it? Of course, I drank it. Do I have to say, I intend to go and hold the glass and drink from it and return it back? This might come natural from a robot, but from humans, they don't. When you, they put the biryani in front of you, don't say, I intend to eat the biryani. 
and then discover that it is uh, a cake, for example. Well, you just go ahead and eat it. If you want to answer the call of nature, you go and answer the call of nature. This is the intention. So there is not a specific thing you say. And this is what the Prophet used to do, alayhi salatu salam. Saying it verbally is an innovation. The Prophet did not do it, Allahumma salli wa sallam alayhi, neither his companions at all. So by doing it, you would be innovating. One would say, all types of ibadah, all types of ibadah, even fasting, even fasting. Tomorrow is Ramadan. My intention is to fast. When I have the pre-dawn meal, sahur, what is this? I never eat at four o'clock. So what is this? This is my intention. I'm eating because I'm fasting tomorrow. If I go to bed and I sleep thinking that I have to wake before Fajr so that I can eat an apple and drink a glass of water and I overslept until after Fajr. Is my fasting correct? No. Who says it's correct? Raise your hands please. One, two, three, four. Who says it's incorrect? Meaning that four was, were listening. <laughs> Five. Five were listening and the rest did not know the question. I'll ask you the question again after the break. And if you're sleeping, I'll have to make you wake up. Stay tuned, inshallah. We'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. Just before the break, I've asked a question and got four people to answer or five. And the rest did not comment. So I'll ask the question again. And I beg you to stay awake. I know the class is a little bit boring. The teacher is a little bit boring. But the subject is not. The subject is very, very important. And by mastering it, you will become your own sheikh. Of course, after maybe 20, 30 years. But eventually, you will reach there. So we go for the question. If a person, before going to sleep, said to himself, put the alarm uh, clock on four o'clock so that he would wake up and eat some yogurt, drink some water, because he's fasting the first day of Ramadan. And subhanAllah, he overslept. He was so tired, he only woke up after the iqamah for the prayer was done. So is this person considered to be fasting or his fast is not acceptable? Those who say his fast is acceptable, raise your hands, please. Masha Allah, tabarakallah. Okay, now we have consensus of the scholars, so the answer is yes. His fasting is acceptable, though he did not say anything. He did not eat anything, but the intention was in his heart. Now one would say, okay, if you say that this is in all forms of worship, what about talbiyah and hajj? Why do I say, labbayka Allahumma umrah? Why do I say labbayka Allahumma hajj? Why do I say labbayka Allahumma umratan mutamatti'an biha ila al-hajj? Isn't this niya? The answer is, no, it is not. This is called talbiyah. And the scholars all agree that if I put on my ihram and I go for hajj without saying this, my hajj is valid. And I've just said the three types of hajj verbally. Labbaik Allahumma, well actually Umrah is a Umrah. Labbaik Allahumma Hajj is Ifrad. Labbaik Allahumma Umratan wa Hajjah. This is Qiran. Labbaik Allahumma Umratan mutamatti'an biha lil Hajj. This is Tamattu'. So, I've just said it. Does this make me in the state of Ihram? No. Because I did not intend it. So the intention is in the heart. Now, from this hadith, we have to be extremely careful when it comes to intention. The things you do, they have to be for the sake of Allah. Otherwise, you are in great trouble. Why is that? In Sahih Imam Muslim, the Prophet said, the first three to be thrown in hell are a martyr, a person who knows Quran and knowledge, scholar, and a person who is charitable, who gives money for the cause of Allah. The first three to be thrown in, in hell. The first one who died in the cause of Allah, Allah brings him and he shows him all the favors and blessings that Allah bestowed upon him in dunya and said, what did you do? He said, I fought for your cause until I died. 
A martyr, Allah says, you're lying, you fought, so that they would say you're brave. Throw him in hell. The other scholar, he said, I taught people Quran, and I practiced what I taught. He said, you're a liar. You taught them so that they would say you're a Qari. And the third one, to say that you are generous. So the intention is extremely important. Now we live so long on this earth. We did so many good deeds. But the problem is, will Allah accept them or not? The problem is, were they for the sake of Allah or not? And that is why the best thing for you to work on is not your body, it's not your muscles, it's not your investments, it's not your kids, it's your intention. The minute you have a good intention, everything changes. And that is why scholars say that I would have an intention even when I drink a glass of water. Imagine waking up at 2 a.m. You go to the kitchen. You make a cup of espresso, coffee, with the intention that I'm going to pray for two hours, night prayer, and I'd like to be awake. Your preparation of that coffee, drinking it, is a form of worship. It's ibadah. You're rewarded. I drink coffee and I'm rewarded? Yes. Not only that, the Prophet said in Islam, if you have intimate relationship with your wife, this is a ibadah and Allah will reward you. And the companions flipped. Prophet of Allah, one of us fulfills his desires and lust and he's rewarded. And the Prophet of Allah said, yeah, if you do it in haram, would you be sinful? Then likewise, if you do it in halal, Allah would reward you. So it is extremely important to understand and to purify our intention. However, what does this have to do with our book? Now we're talking about purity, about cleanliness, about removing the filth and uplifting the hadith. And this has to be with intention because prayer itself requires conditions. To pray, you have to have conditions. What is the meaning of conditions? Shart. Yeah, but what, what, was, what is the definition? Is it in the, uh, in the same form of worship? Yes. Without which the ibadah is not accepted. So it is a condition. before or during or after? It's before. It's before. Conditions are the things that without them, the ibadah would not be acceptable. However, with them being fulfilled, the ibadah may or may not be present. What do you mean? For example, I'll give you an example. Wudu, ablution, is shart, is a condition of salah. Correct? Meaning, if I want to pray, if I don't have my ablution on, my prayer is invalid. But if I have my ablution on, do I have to go and pray? No. That is why we're not, before going to bed, part of the sunnah is that you offer ablution before you sleep. Why? Because the Prophet told us that there is an angel that comes between my blanket and my body. And whenever I turn around, he says, Oh Allah, forgive him. Oh Allah, have mercy on him. So being pure before going to sleep is one of the things that the Prophet recommended us to do sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we have conditions of prayer, such as purity, such as the entrance of the time, such as covering the awrah, such as facing the qibla, such as the niyyah. Of course, there are other uh, conditions required in all kinds of forms of worship, such as Islam, reaching the age of uh, being able to differentiate things, tamiz they call, and sanity. If someone who's insane and wants to make a form of worship, this is not acceptable. Because you have to be sane. You have to be in the state that allows you to do this. Okay. Now, let's, let's take questions before moving on. Because this hadith of niya probably would take three sessions or more just for questions if we would like to have them. So, um, Brother Khalib, you have a question? Uh, Sheikh, you mentioned that... If you start with your salah, then if you have the intention for zuhr, and then in between you change it to asr. I've read it in one of the books that if the intention in the beginning 
and the intention in the ending, if it is the same, then in between, if there are any waswas, that it doesn't matter. Yes. Is that right? The waswas in between does not matter, but here in the case that I've mentioned, I was not talking about waswas. The man initially started prayer as dhuhr and then changed it when he realized that it is asr time. So this is not a waswas. This is actual changing from dhuhr to asr. Now, yeah, the waswas is, I started dhuhr, it is dhuhr time. In the middle, I got ideas of, shall I change it into voluntary, shall I change it? And this is waswas coming to me. And I ignored it and I continued my dhuhr prayer. So there is a difference between the two scenarios, and Allah knows best. Yes, brother. And then we'll move to you, Shah. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Regarding intention, uh, the problem comes like uh, when someone is earning through working in the field of da'wah, or else he's teaching the Quran, he's a qari, or teaching fiqh, and he earns his living through that. Now his intention is, please Allah, and he also intends you know that he will get money from that, he might get increment and so on. So how about this intention, like when both of them, you know, reconcile? Okay, it's, a, it's an issue of dispute among scholars and however, if you look in the Sunnah, you'd find that there were people who took money for things related to da'wah or to Islam. Scholars said that it is permissible for person to charge for teaching the Qur'an. And there's a hadith that says that the best thing to charge money for is the Qur'an, when you teach the Qur'an. However, they say that if someone is not in need, it is befitting for him not to charge anything. Especially for the adhan. And that is why the Prophet used to say, take someone to call the adhan who does not charge money. Yet the scholars said, if the man had no occupancy, no job, Except this, what to do five times a day? How can I go to the uh, mosque and give adhan if I'm working somewhere else? So this is okay to get, to get money, to get paid for your job as an imam, as a teacher, as a so and so. But what is your intention? If I work in a masjid as an imam and they give me, for example, X, Y, Z. Or if I don't work as an imam and someone comes to me and says, Sheikh, can you become the imam of my masjid? And I say, how much are you going to pay me? He says, 4,000. He says, the, the masjid next door gave me 7,000. You match that or I'm not coming. Now, this is business. This has nothing to do with getting something. If you work, your intention is to spread the deen. And you get a job on top of that, mashallah. What's wrong in that? But if your intention is solely for the money, not for the da'wah, then... This goes clearly against your intention, and Allah Azza wa Jalla knows best. This is all the time we have until we meet next time. Fiyamanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.